Topic 12, the power for Christian decision making. Last time we talked about the guide for Christian decision making. In this session, we talk about the power. And it says this, our, our key thought is this, the power to live according to God's law comes from, you guessed it, that dynamite, the gospel. Gospel. The power to live according to God's law comes from the gospel. Now, wait a minute. Aren't there people other than Christians who live a good life? Do you have to be a Christian in order to live a good life? And I'm going to give you a real definitive answer. Yes and no. <laughs> no, you don't have to be a Christian to live a good life. I can point out wonderful people all over the place who do not believe in God, who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who lead good lives. I can point out religions that have wonderful teachings but are not the Christian religion. And this shouldn't surprise us because, you see, God did something with our first parents, Adam and Eve, which continues in our lives today. And that is he wrote the law on their hearts. Each one of us has a conscience. We have what might be called a natural knowledge. We're born with a knowledge. Now, it's not a perfect knowledge because we're imperfect, we're flawed, we're sinners. But we have somewhat of a knowledge that God, there's a God and that he has certain expectations of us. Listen to this in Romans 2 verse 15. They, that is the Gentiles, the unbelievers, they show that some requirements found in Moses' teachings, that is in the Ten Commandments, are written in their hearts. Their consciences speak to them. Their thoughts accuse them on one occasion and defend them on another. By the way, I want to point out to you that I will read from different translations of the Bible. So if this doesn't look quite like your Romans 2.15, I thought it explained it a little easier, so I used this particular translation called the God's Word translation. But, uh, you know, you've read about, in Central America, it was either the Aztecs or the Incas, what they would do is uh, they had some kind of an idea that there was a, a God of some sort and that they didn't quite measure up to what this God wanted. So they would go to the top of their ziggurats or their uh, pyramids or whatever they call them, their temples, and they would take with them a young person, a maiden or a warrior, and they would tie that person up, look to their God, and with that person still alive, they would cut the sacrificial person, they would cut the person's heart out of them and lift the heart up, still beating, lift it up to their God. Now, isn't that interesting? They have some concepts there that are accurate, but they're kind of fuzzy. The reality is we don't live up to the perfect standard and some kind of a sacrifice has to be made. But it isn't going to be a human being. Human sacrifice, not only is it horrible, abhorrent, but it is also useless. I mean, how can a sinful person make sacrifice for you and for me? But what they kind of understood was somehow they had to get right with God. Do you see how the real religion says it is through the cross of Jesus Christ that we are made right with God? Uh, you know, it would be interesting to try an experiment. If we could take a bunch of little children and, um, and, and take care of them, make sure they have food and water and all that, but give them no moral teachings. And when they get old enough, you know, let's pretend they're, keep them in an, on, a, on a deserted island except for them, and... And then, as they grow older, they have to make rules and regulations in order to uh, interact with one another. The thing is, and it will be fuzzy, it won't be perfect. In fact, there'll be many bad things about it. But there'll be enough things we recognize we will say, hey, those rules, even if it's faint, they sort of echo the Ten Commandments. Well, you know why now? Because God's Law is written on their hearts, Moses' teachings. When I was a student at Vanderbilt University, I almost lost my faith because I took a comparative religions class where the professor said, ah, you see, all the religions of the world have the same 
roughly the same teachings. And I thought, oh, there's nothing unique about Christianity. But wait, of course Christianity is unique. Because uh, even though it shares in common with other religions, laws, rules, and regulations, since God wrote the law on our hearts, what makes Christianity unique is that while all those, all those other religions talk about what you have to do to earn heaven, Christianity says God makes this first move. He comes down to us and gives to us the gift of everlasting life. So no, um, you don't have to be a Christian in order to live a good life. Even unbelievers uh, will, will oftentimes live very nice lives. But on the other hand, yes, you do need to be a Christian in order to live a godly life. Because the good life, the godly life, the good things you do, the good works that you do, say, or think, well, for a Christian, they are done in faith, trusting in Jesus according to the Ten Commandments, so that God may be glorified and your neighbor might benefit, your neighbor being anyone who has need. Hebrews 11, verse 2, God says in there, without faith it is impossible to please God. No matter how much the unbeliever through nice things can help the world, ultimately those don't please God because those deeds are not done for God's glory. A good work is done in faith toward Jesus Christ for the glory of God and the service of others. Now, we talked about must you be a Christian in order to live a good life. Second question is from where? Does the power come to live the Christian life? And the answer is from Jesus Christ. He is the gospel, the good news, right in human form. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Again, reading from my God's Word translation. Paul writes, Whoever is a believer in Christ is a new creation. The old way of living has disappeared. A new way of living has come into existence. That's what the gospel does. It breaks through our unbelief. It makes us new creations. We are remade. We're, 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 we're what God intended for his creation, loving him and loving one another. So when we do a good work, trusting in Jesus for God's glory and the service of others, it is God who supplies the power to do that through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It comes from Jesus Christ, and the Bible goes on, and in one of my favorite passages, it comes from Jesus Christ living in us. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. We'll talk more about that when we talk about baptism, how God connects us with the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. But Paul writes here, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And then Paul goes on and says, The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when I do good works, trusting in Jesus for God's glory and the service of others, you know, I, I can say that I do them as a new creation, but I also want to say it's the power of Christ just pulsating in me and working through me and pulsating in you and working uh, through you. Christ lives in you. Christ occupies your life. You are a Christian, one who has been bought by the Lord Jesus Christ. You're, as Paul says in several of his letters, you're a slave for Christ. Your life, your eternity is controlled by him. And what better control is there? For he loves and cares for us so much. Live a life energized by the Christ who lives in you. Please pray with me. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power to live according to your law, the power that comes from the gospel. We thank you, Lord, even for unbelievers who do good things in our world, for indeed they are uh, servants of, of, of all, 
And they are people whom you love dearly and for whom your son Jesus Christ died. But Lord, in the midst of these good deeds, we're thankful that we can turn to Jesus and see in him the power, uh, the, the, the pulsating power to do these things. Help us, Lord, as we serve your world, as we glorify you, to help others to see you as the source for any good that we do, any blessing that we have, and for the eternity that is ours. We ask all of these things through the power of the Holy Spirit and pray them in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.